Good morning everyone, my name is Michelle, I hope you're doing well and it's very very foggy this morning, the visibility is really poor but welcome to episode 9 of Crime Story Sunday. This is going to be the last episode of Crime Story Sunday of 2021. Next Sunday is Boxing Day here in the UK. It's a public holiday so I'm going to be busy. So Crime Story Sunday will return in two weeks time. I've got some really good crime stories that I've got in the works for January 2022. So hopefully you don't miss me too much next week. There will be other content coming out on uh, Michelle After Dark. This particular series is going to just take a break for just that one week. Today, we're going to be looking at the Christmas Day massacre of the Lawson family. And this is a stark reminder of the brutality of familicide. The term familicide refers to a type of murder in which a perpetrator kills multiple close family members in quick succession. Research shows that in about half of these cases, the killer goes on to take their own life. And that was the case here. Tobacco farmer Charles Davis Lawson, known as Charlie, murdered his wife and six of his seven children on Christmas Day. It's a lot and we'd better get into this story. Now, there isn't very much known about the background of our killer this week. Normally, I like to give kind of a background, an introduction, talking about the killer's early life, and perhaps it gives some insights in what they become later on and what, what instigated them to become a murderer. So, what we do know is that Charlie Lawson was born in 1886 to Augustus and Nancy Lawson. He grew up in Lawsonville, a town named after himself, or at least his family, I'm guessing. This is in North Carolina, and it's a small working class township, which is still very, very, very small to this day. In 1911, Charlie Lawson married someone called Fanny Mannering with whom he had eight children. The third born, William, who was born in 1914, died of an illness when he was uh, six years old in 1920. But the seven other children were healthy and were thriving. In 1918, following the move of his younger brothers, Marion and Elijah, to um, a town called Germanton, which is slightly bigger than Lawsonville, and it's in just a little over 20 miles away. Perhaps there was more prospects in Germanton for farming than there was in Lawsonville. That's just my speculation. But the Lawson family, Charlie's family, decided to follow suit up sticks and move to Germanton. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It could be Germanton, Germanton. I don't know. I don't know. I might be putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable, but not to worry. So the Lawson family worked as tenant tobacco farmers. They'd saved enough money by 1927 to buy their own farm in Germanton. It was a ramshackle little farmhouse and there was a separate barn where they could store their crop. And the family were in the process of, of doing up this farmhouse. So, you know, they had long-term plans to stay there. Now that takes us to the, the time of the murders. In 1929, shortly before Christmas, just a few days before Christmas, Charlie, who's age 43 at the time, took his wife Fanny, who's age 37, and there's seven children, all of them. So we've got Marie, age 17, Arthur, age 16. As I said, William, the third born, had already died. Then we've got Carrie, age 12, Mabel, age seven, James age four, Raymond age two, and little Mary Lou, who was only four months old at the time. And he took them all into town to buy new clothes for Christmas. And this might have been Charlie getting into the Christmas spirit. 
they didn't have very much money. They were saving everything they had to plough into their business. As I said, you know, this was meant to be, a, you know, a family business that they could build up and run and maybe pass on to their children. But they all went into town to buy new clothes and Charlie splashed out to have a formal photograph taken of them all. And this was unusual for a working class family. You know, this was, this was expensive to kit out, you know, seven kids with new clothes, plus themselves with new clothes, and have this formal photograph taken wasn't cheap. People since have speculated that this was something Charlie planned to do, to have that last photograph as a, a reminder of his family, a reminder to the other members of the family. Or it could simply have been gifting his family, who perhaps he loved, perhaps he loved with all his heart. We just don't know that kind of detail is always lost in time. So this is that photo. Standing in the photograph at the back, starting from left to right, 16-year-old Arthur, then we've got Marie, and then we've got their parents. Charlie, it's been said, he's got like a, a sly smirk on his face. I don't know, I think people are perhaps projecting, you know, intent on him, because we know, benefit and fine sight, we know what happened just a few days later. But, I don't know, people have, have speculated on the, the facial expressions of these guys. Let me know, let me know in the comments if you spot anything, you know, unusual about the people in the photograph. And of course, Fanny is holding four-month-old baby Lou. On the bottom row, we've got, again from left to right, we've got the, the younger Lawson children. We've got James four, Mabel seven, Raymond two and Carrie twelve. Just a few days later, on the 25th of December, Christmas Day, this is when the massacre occurred. So on that day, December 25th, 1929, 17-year-old Marie got up early. She wanted to make a Christmas cake, double tears with icing. She really wanted to please her family Perhaps she was a good cook and, uh, you know, she wanted to bake this spectacular cake so they could all enjoy it. And uh, she got up early so that it would all be ready and the icing would be set and everything for the later festivities. Sometime after this, you know, I don't know what time it was, let's say mid-morning, the two middle Lawson girls, Carrie and Mabel, left the house to go and visit their aunt, an uncle, because remember, there's two brothers who live nearby, Marion and Elijah. I don't know which uncle they were going to visit. They were going to leave the farm and just walk the short distance to their aunt and uncle's property. Unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't make it off the farm. Little Carrie and Mabel were the first to die because hiding behind the tobacco barn, out of sight, was their father, Charlie and he was waiting with a shotgun. Charlie shot both of his daughters and then he bludgeoned them to death. And then he took their bodies and he hid them inside the barn. He didn't just dump them though, he carefully laid them out on the backs with their arms crossed in front of them. And he put rocks behind their heads to act as pillows. It was like he just laid them to rest there. But he then, straight away, returned to the family house and there was Fanny, his wife. She was sitting on the porch, peeling potatoes for the, the Christmas dinner that was going to happen in a few hours' time. But he just shot her, shot her dead, there where she sat. He then moved inside where Marie was busy cooking and her two younger brothers were there, James and Raymond, who were just playing like little kids do, excited because it was Christmas. And they saw their father coming in with a gun and they ran. They ran to hide. Marie, however, was shot dead. Shot her there where she stood, baking the Christmas cake. He had to go and find the two little boys. He found them and he shot them, his final victim. 
was this four-month-old baby girl, Mary Lou, who was in her crib, safe and sound, snug as a bug in a rug. He didn't shoot her. He bludgeoned her to death. She was found there with a fractured skull. The victims that died in the house, he did the same with them as he did with the two girls that he laid to rest in the tobacco barn. He laid them all out with their arms crossed over their chests and he put pillows under their heads, again, as if they were sleeping. But there's one more child who didn't die that day. And this is 16-year-old Arthur. And I find this really interesting. Now, accounts are conflicting on this, but there's one account that I find particularly intriguing. And that is this. Charlie sent 16-year-old Arthur on an errand, allegedly to buy bullets for the traditional Christmas Day rabbit hunt that was going to occur later that day. Now, I've never heard of rabbit hunting being a tradition on Christmas, but maybe it was a tradition in that area, maybe it was just a tradition in the family. And he sent Arthur into town to buy more bullets. Now, it's interesting why Arthur was sent to buy bullets because Charlie obviously had bullets because he'd been using them to shoot Daddy's family. Maybe he didn't have enough bullets and he sent Arthur for more. Or maybe it was an excuse. Maybe he wanted to save his firstborn son. Arthur survived. He survived the massacre. And he was the only surviving sibling out of the seven children. So I can't imagine what Arthur went through. I can't imagine the survivor guilt and the, the, the grief he must have felt. Just simply awful to put on the shoulders of a 16-year-old boy. Now, again, what happened next is a cause for controversy because there's two separate accounts on this. One account say that it was the brothers, Marion and Elijah, who found the, the corpses laid out, shot and bludgeoned to death. Other accounts say that it's Arthur who found them and raised the alarm. That when he got back home, he was just met with this horrific sight. Whichever way, the alarm was raised and... Uh, and people started to gather at the Lawson home. Allegedly, and there's a, there's a photograph of this, it's not very clear to make out, but it was just a bloodbath. And there was so much blood that neighbours could literally scoop it up. You know, it was just pools and pools of blood. But where was Charlie? Where did Charlie go? after he murdered his family. He annihilated his family. This was a family annihilation. Now, rightly, family annihilation is it's kind of said to occur when all members of the family die, but I think this is, I think this is an annihilation. I'm not gonna split hairs on terminology. This, this, is, just, this is just too much. But Charlie was missing and uh, it took a few hours to find him. But in the afternoon, as light was failing, a single gunshot was heard from the nearby woods. And the story goes that Arthur and a police officer, they found Charlie's body. And they also found a couple of letters that he'd written, but they didn't explain why he did it. In fact, those letters appeared to be unfinished and, and didn't make sense. So it was clear that Charlie was in some kind of perhaps mental health crisis, that he wasn't thinking clearly, that his mind was rushing, his mind was just all over the place. But whose mind wouldn't be all over the place when you just killed your entire family, save one son? But what they found was that in the snow 
there was footprints that went round and round one tree, a dogwood tree, round and round and round, as if Charlie had been frantically pacing, contemplating what he'd done and trying to build up courage to take his own life. But eventually he did. That single gunshot in his head ended his life. So this was almost a family annihilation, a familicide that resulted in murder-suicide. The farmhouse was on a hill and they had a real job getting all of these bodies down the hill. It was snowing, it was cold, light was failing by this time. They eventually did it. And Dr. C.J. Hasselbeck was the Stokes County coroner at the time. And he was the one who conducted the autopsies. And he did all of this on Christmas night. And he and a colleague who'd been visiting for Christmas from John Hopkins University, they worked into the night, into the early hours to conduct these autopsies. And, uh, and they went above and beyond because they wanted to understand how a father could do this to six of his seven children and the wife that he claimed to love. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we could, we could ask that about any familicide case. Why, why, why does it happen? So what they decided to do was remove Charlie's brain and see if they could work out why he'd done what he'd done by paying special attention to this brain. It was placed in a jar with formaldehyde and it was sent to John Hopkins University. So they were just looking at the, the basic anatomy of the brain to see if there was any flaws in it that they could find. I think they were probably clutching at straws. I think just like anybody, they were horrified by what had happened and they wanted to find out why. They wanted to give answers perhaps to the community. But uh, yeah, more on that in a sec. So it is alleged that 5,000 people, uh, that's a lot of people. I don't know whether numbers have been exaggerated over the years, but a lot of people attended this funeral because the news had spread far and wide. You know, this was just a little town, a little farming town where people were close knit. People from Lawsonville, you know, family, probably distant family and so on. Everybody wanted to be there to pay respects to this beautiful family who'd just been wiped out. Each were in their own white casket, except for little Mary Lou, little four-month-old Mary Lou, who was buried in her mother's coffin, in her mother's arms, which I think is a really nice touch. What isn't a nice touch, though, is uh, the entire family was buried in the same plot as the man that had killed them. I find it a bit strange. Maybe they wanted to hope that they were all together in heaven. They were all together happy, as perhaps they'd once been. I, I don't know. I don't know what the rationale was for that, but I just find it kind of strange, <laughs> you know, looking at it. Looking at it from modern eyes, maybe, maybe it is. It's where I find it strange anyway. I don't know about you. Now, after the funeral, tourists still continued to seek answers and, and come to the Lawson home and see for themselves the scene of the crime, which seems really morbid. Maybe it was like paying homage. Maybe it was paying respects. Maybe there's just a morbid fascination. I mean, you're listening to this story. You know, you've got a morbid fascination in murders. So do I. So you've got to kind of think it was a different time back then and perhaps people were less perhaps less soft. You know, people used to, at that time, people used to go and see public hangings, didn't they? You know, they were, they were closer to death. Death was something that was just a part of life. I mean, it is today, but I think we're cushioned from it a little bit today. Maybe more so than in times gone by. But Charlie's brother, Marion, he had a business head on him and he decided to make some money for this. So maybe he took some of the profits for himself 
But he reckoned that, you know, Arthur, the surviving child, needed money to start a new life. So that was his reasoning. So hopefully Arthur did get the bulk of this money. But Marion's bright idea was to start charging tourists to come and see. It's a good idea. Tourists were coming anyway. And at its peak, 500 people a day were coming to see the murder scene and the, the Lawson farm. Again, that sounds a lot of people, perhaps numbers have been exaggerated a bit. I don't know, but a lot of people. And, uh, and this made money, it really did, out of people's morbid curiosity. And there's some funny things that have, uh, have come down to us. The scene had just been left there. Allegedly, people scooped up the blood. They'd also took all the bark from the tree as like a memento the tree that Charlie walked and walked and walked around. They even started stealing raisins from the cake that Marie was baking at the time that had just been left there, kind of half prepared. And they had to protect this cake. You know, it was getting destroyed by people, taking raisins as mementos. But a year later, in 1930, all of the family's belongings were auctioned off, which raised a lot of money. Again, perhaps Marion took some but hopefully most of it went to Arthur to start a new life. The house was eventually demolished and it's said that Marion buried Marie's cake at the spot where the house once stood. I mean, obviously these might be embellished. We don't actually know, but you know, these are just kind of nice little touches that perhaps really did happen. You know, as a, perhaps that final sign of respect Marion buried Marie's cake. 16 years after his family had been murdered in 1945, Arthur Lawson was killed in a motor accident, leaving a wife and four children. I don't know, I don't know what happened to Arthur Lawson's family, but hopefully they were able to, you know, live, live a, a decent life. I, I don't know, I just hope, I just hope so anyway. All right, so why? Why do we think that Charlie Lawson did this? Now, remember the coroner sent the brain off to John Hopkins University to see if there was anything that could be seen on the brain or in the brain. Because months before the event, a few months before the event, Charlie Lawson had sustained a head injury whilst he was renovating the farmhouse. Charlie, Fanny and the two older children, Marie and Arthur, spent their evenings working on the farmhouse. And Charlie had sustained a head injury. So it was kind of thought that perhaps this had something to do with it. And reports from people who knew Charlie said that he'd become more easily angered shorter tempered and we do know actually that damage to the frontal lobe the very front of your brain can cause personality changes if that part of your brain is injured because there sits your personality there sits your executive function the higher level functioning of the brain so perhaps there's something in that but the autopsy of the brain didn't reveal anything untoward at all we're probably looking at changes to the brain that were perhaps neurological within individual neurons or neurochemical. I don't know. Now, the other possibility that came out in 1990 when a book, White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, was published and there was a claim made that Charlie was essaying 17-year-old Marie and uh, it began with an anonymous source who came forward and gave this detail. The day before the book was to be published, the author received a phone call from Stella Lawson, who was a relative. She'd already been interviewed for the book, but she'd missed out some details and she wanted to tell her truth. And Stella said that she'd overheard Fanny's sister-in-law and aunts in the family including Stella's mother, Jetty, who was Charlie's sister. So Charlie's sister, Jetty, had been talking. Stella was her 
daughter. So Stella was Charlie Lawson's niece. Fanny had confided in them, in Jetty and others, that she knew that there was an incestuous relationship going on between Charlie and Marie. Jetty actually died in 1928, a year before the murders. So this was something that Fanny had been talking about for a few months, a year, at least a year. So it had been going on for a while. Now, Marie was 17 at the time of her death. So if this is true, exactly how long had this incestuous relationship been going on? Don't know. More support for this theory came out in 2006 when there was a book called The Meaning of Our Tears published by the same author who'd done more digging into the case. Now, I haven't read either of these books. I, I don't know whether any of you guys have read these books. But a close friend of Marie Lawson's, this was someone called Ella May, came forward and disclosed that a few weeks before Christmas, a few weeks before that fateful day, the 25th of December, 1929, Marie had confided in this friend that she was pregnant she was pregnant by her own father. Now, if we go back to that final photo, you can't really tell, but does Marie look like she's pregnant? I kind of can see kind of a, a thicker set, maybe. I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. But the fact that this came from two different sources, from Stella, Charlie's niece, and then later, a friend of Marie came forward, obviously, at, at, at this time, 2006, a very old lady. Now, another close friend and neighbour, this, this comes down to us, called Hill Hampton, stated that he knew of serious problems going on in the family, but he declined to elaborate on it. So were the kind of local neighbours... Were people aware that there was maybe domestic violence going on? Maybe this incestuous relationship was, was well known and just no one had reported it. No one wanted to talk about it. I don't know, guys. I don't know. And maybe everything just got too much for Charlie. Maybe he, he was remorseful. Maybe he hated what he'd done to his family and he knew that when this come out they'd be pariahs and that's why he decided to end it all end all of them except Arthur why, why did he save Arthur did he save Arthur intentionally his firstborn son or was that just a pure coincidence I don't know there's so many questions that I've got about this case. There's always questions that I have about familicide, but this one, and uh, to be honest, I'd never heard of this case until a couple of weeks ago. Never heard of it. And uh, I, was, I was searching around looking for a good story that was Christmas related, and, and this one came up, and, uh, and yeah, I'm uh, a little bit enamoured by it. Very curious about it, so I'm going to try and, and get those books and see what more there is. But anyway, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this story. It's gruesome, it's horrible, it's poignant, because it's Christmas, but... And it leaves us with as many questions as there are answers. But uh, as I said at the beginning of this uh, video taking a break next week because it's boxing day but episode 10 of crime story sunday will uh, will come out on the 2nd of january and of course you're not going to be void of content because there's going to be lots of content coming out on my other channel michelle after dark so check that out if you if you have a mind to and i'll see you very soon it's goodbye from miss tillington it's goodbye from Miss Cassie Springer, who quite frankly could be anywhere in the fog. She'll come back. She'll come back. All right. Bye, guys.